Next on the agenda is uh, the uh, working group experts that will guide us through the two consultations on Euribor uh, fallbacks. Uh, and as mentioned at the start, there will be uh, an opportunity for questions afterwards. I will therefore now give the floor to Adolfo Fraguas. Uh, he is the head of the legal department at BBVA Spain, and he is also chair of the subgroup on contractual robustness of the working group on risk-free rates. Uh, and he will explain the working group's main proposals with regard to Euribor fallback trigger event. Adolfo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Well, we are going now to talk uh, about the public consultation on uh, Euribor fallback trigger events. But first, perhaps uh, we need to, to, to make an effort to answer a question which uh, would be necessary. And the question is, why does the market need Euribor fallback provisions? If we move to the next slide, please. I think that we are all here aware that critical benchmarks are undergoing significant reforms. Uh, we are not going to enter into the reasons for these reforms. They are all well known and have uh, already mentioned by my, my previous colleagues. But I think that uh, it, was, it is worth uh, mentioning three main milestones that uh, have, uh, have uh, uh, all of us come to this point uh, in, this, uh, in this process. The first would be the IOSCO principles for financial benchmarks. They were issued in 2013 and they were recommendations for administrators and uh, submitters of quotes uh, uh, for benchmarks. These recommendations were mainly in terms of governance, uh, on the quality of the benchmark, the methodology, the accountability, at the end of the day, on the increase of the credibility of uh, the benchmarks. The second uh, milestone was the FSB, the Financial Stability Board recommendations on reforming major interest rate benchmarks in 2014 and the purpose uh, the objectives of this uh, of this document was twofold first it was to strengthen uh, the way in which uh, existing benchmarks were calculated in order for for them to be based on transaction data as much as possible instead of other alternatives such as quotes either firm or not or expert judgment or whatever the second uh, objective uh, was to, to encourage the market to develop alternative nearly risk-free reference rates with the purpose to complete and, uh, if necessary, substitute existing benchmark offer rates. And I think that uh, all this has uh, been successfully achieved. The, the strengthen of Euribor was completed on 2019. I will uh, refer to it uh, a little bit later. And in terms of risk-free rates, we can congratulate ourselves to have uh, already in the, in the, in the main um, currencies uh, risk-free reference rates. For instance, with the US dollar, we have SOFOR, with the uh, sterling, we have uh, SONIA, and uh, here in, Euro, uh, in Europe, we have the Euro SDR. And uh, the third milestone would be the, the, the benchmark regulation, the European Union benchmark regulation enacted on 2016, which came into force in January 2018. This is uh, for sure a major milestone with, I think, no equivalence in the world. And at the end of the day, it uh, stated that supervised entities, and with supervised entities, I refer to what benchmark regulation refers, that is banks, uh, investment firms, asset managers, insurance companies, and the like, supervised entities in order to continue using those benchmarks that were being used uh, 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 until this point in time in contracts and financial instruments need to have the administrator of this benchmark duly authorized before the authorities. And this authorization is the result of a tough evaluation of the compliance of the requirements of the benchmark regulation, which, as I have said, are very, very significant. So all this um, came to a point in which, uh, as uh, Yosco and BMR were encouraging, result in a, in, a, in a recommendation in the need to introduce robust fallbacks in contracts 
in order to tackle the possible uh, seismic of, uh, of an index. So all these uh, Uribor uh, and in general terms benchmark reform came to a point in which uh, it was clear that uh, we need to introduce robust fallbacks if we didn't already have them in our contracts. If we move to next slide, please. This is what uh, happened with the benchmark regulation in Article 28.2. This legal need for Eurobar fallback provision was therein included, and it stated that supervised entities are required to produce and maintain robust written plans, which will foresee what to do in the event that uh, a benchmark is uh, seized or materially changes. And it included uh, uh, an obligation to include an alternative benchmark if the previous one was uh, CC, no longer provided, and if this alternative uh, benchmark was uh, feasible and appropriate, if there is one to include. But on top of that, the benchmark regulation also required all the supervised entities to provide, upon request of the authorities, these written plans to to them, to the competent authorities. And also, which uh, is completely reasonable, to reflect these written plans in their contractual relationships with clients. And this is reasonable because at the end of the day, the objective of, of these robust written plans uh, have to be translated into the private uh, relationships in order to include therein the, the outcome of these robust written plans expected to be to be in the uh, to be to be set out by the supervised entities and the the main purpose of all this was to to reduce legal uncertainty to avoid uh, the possibility of a legal dispute because as we all know if uh, the the benchmark that we are using which is normally the, the mean to calculate uh, the contribution by one party to the other or the price of the contract uh, disappears, it would create not only uncertainty, but for sure disputes. One party could argue and advocate for the continuation of the contract. The other party could um, advocate for the termination, the determination of the contract. The one advocating for the continuation will have to discuss which would be the, the new reference to be used if it has not already been agreed in the past and so on and so forth. But uh, perhaps in order to, to have uh, all the concepts clear, we can move to the next slide. We could uh, stop a little bit uh, in order to, to make for all the audience clear what the fallback provision is and what are its main elements. A fallback provision is a contractual clause uh, agreed among the parties that determines what is the rate that will apply in a certain point in time if the initially agreed one is not available anymore. So as I have mentioned, without these fallbacks, legal uncertainty, disputes and problems will arise. And what are the elements of uh, a fallback provision? Mainly four. First, the trigger event. The trigger event is uh, the event that activates the substitution of uh, the old uh, fall, the old rate by the new one, by the fallback one. The second is the fallback rate, which is the, the new rate, the new benchmark that is going to be used in substitution of the old one, the one that is not uh, available anymore. Uh, on addition to this fallback rate, we will need a spread adjustment. The idea is that this uh, spread adjustment, either adding something to the fallback rate or subtracting it will maintain the economic value of the contract will make both the old rate and the new one equivalent and will at the end of the day avoid uh, the transfer of value meaning one party being benefiting uh, with this fallback rate in case of being um, uh, substituted and the other one being prejudiced but by it and finally we have to agree in this contractual provision this fallback provision the effective date of the of the fallback uh, rate when it will be really applicable once the trigger event has been activated so uh, if we move to the next page 
despite the legal need to have uh, these uh, written plans, uh, and unlike other rivals, I think that we have to congratulate ourselves uh, because we can affirm that the rival is not scheduled to be discontinued. The rival has uh, been experiencing a reform that has already been mentioned previously in order to meet uh, the benchmark regulation requirements, basically in, in two major uh, aspects. First, strengthening its governance framework. It uh, has uh, been evolved, uh, the, the code of conduct has been evolved. Uh, there is a need for auditing. There are many new obligations for um, contributors that have made more robust the uh, URIVO. And additionally, uh, there has been a, a, a development of what is called the hybrid methodology in order to permit URIVO being based on Euro money market transactions. This is, as uh, Stephen Major has just mentioned, uh, what has made it uh, more robust, resilient, and transparent. So this uh, came to a point in which the authorization of, uh, of the administrator and therefore the index was achieved on July the 2nd, 2019 by the Financial Services and Markets Authority, the Belgian Authority, under Article 34 BMR. This uh, authorization is very important because it permits all supervised entities to continue using URIBOR from uh, this point in which was uh, approved onwards. Otherwise, in one year time, we will have a major problem if uh, it hadn't been authorized because uh, the index, the rival, wouldn't be able to be used uh, anymore. So this risk has been uh, avoided. And I think that we have to congratulate ourselves of uh, the final goal of this uh, process. But besides, uh, we think uh, that it's important to mention that uh, all this ecosystem has also, uh, and thanks to the benchmark regulation, some precautionary measures and supervisory powers that uh, permits us to affirm that uh, the risk of uh, substitution being needed uh, is, uh, is minimized, at least as much as possible, even though we cannot rely only in these uh, precautionary measures or supervisory powers. There are mainly three. Uh, first, mandatory contribution, this is the possibility for the authorities to uh, compel the contributors, the old ones or new ones, to contribute to the index when the representativeness of a critical benchmark is put at risk. The second one is the mandatory administration. It, is, uh, uh, it reflects the possibility to compel the, an administrator to continue administering uh, a benchmark in case uh, that it intends to, to cease providing the benchmark, at least until a new administrator is uh, nominated, uh, the index is seized orderly, or it is no longer critical. And finally, uh, there is a possibility also by the authorities to require the administrator to change the methodology, also in order to make uh, the index uh, representative of the, of the underlying in case that uh, this representativeness would be at uh, risk in a critical benchmark. So, uh, in order to summarize all that I have been uh, mentioning, the rival is not scheduled to be discontinued. These are for sure good news for everybody. But, however, we need to include fallback provisions in our relationships among counterparties. First, because we are prudent and we have to avoid the legal uncertainty and the disputes coming from uh, an eventual possibility to to have a benchmark ceasing and not having a substitute for it and second because we have to comply with uh, just code principles and more importantly with the benchmark regulation with article 28.2 the one i have mentioned before so after this uh, perhaps long introduction we can go uh, to, to what really is the, the subject of this uh, part of the roundtable, which is the public consultation on the rival fallback trigger events. Next slide, please. Um, and the next one. So first, uh, let's uh, try to clarify what is the objective of, of this public consultation. 
the objective is to uh, identify and propose some uh, uh, potential trigger events that would activate your error fallbacks. These uh, potential events are presented before the public or the stakeholders in order for them to opine and to give us their feedback on whether they should be included in the recommendation of the trigger events of um, fallback provision or not. For sure, any participant uh, in, the, in the marketplace will decide afterwards what to do. They are free to uh, agree with their counterparties uh, whether to include or not any of these uh, trigger events in their uh, fallback provisions. And uh, therefore, there is no uh, compulsory uh, measure in all these uh, process. Some general considerations that uh, I think are important uh, before uh, going one by one with the trigger events. First, trigger events should be drafted in precise and objective terms. This is clear. What uh, in order to to have uh, to have uh, trigger events that will not uh, raise debate discussions among parties, they have to be very objective. The more precise they are, the less disputes counterparties would face. And ideally, it would mean that there should be no need to further consent or further debate between the parties in order to determine whether the trigger event uh, exists or not. Second, trigger events should be based on events made public. So it's very important that these trigger events uh, are um, at, uh, detonated when uh, the information is known by all the marketplace. It should never be uh, triggered by uh, a non an informal conversation or by a statement which is not uh, of the public domain. In terms of the effectiveness date of the substitution, we have to differentiate in the, the date in which the trigger event uh, happens and the date in which the fallback rate starts to be applied. And this second one should only occur once the discontinuation of the initially agreed benchmark derival has occurred, not in the date in which the public statement was shared among the, the stakeholders, mainly because uh, it would make uh, all counterparties uh, available to be prepared to the, to the substitution. And therefore, uh, this effectiveness date will imply that only after this effective date, the next interest period should be the one uh, in which the new fallback will apply. And uh, it doesn't seem very, very reasonable to modify the interest rate uh, in the middle of a period of interest. If we go to next uh, slide, and in terms of the scope of the public consultation, four main considerations that are uh, really relevant. First, the public consultation covers all asset classes. And the idea would be that uh, these trigger events on which we are asking uh, stakeholders to opine on uh, would be uh, common for all asset classes. This would uh, avoid uh, inconsistencies and mismatches and therefore would be of, uh, of a great uh, help. We working group already said on October 29, quoted, the working group highlights possible risk management implications of one, having timing inconsistencies in fallback provisions triggers, and second, incorporating different fallback triggers language for different asset classes. So we encourage all the participants to try to to come to a common point in the definition of the trigger events in order to avoid these uh, inconsistencies. Second of these considerations about the scope, uh, the consultation paper is uh, focusing on the permanent discontinuation of your rival. It is not focusing on any potential temporary unavailability, on any potential computer failing, failure which uh, impedes the, the benchmark to be published uh, during some days. This is not the object of the consultation. We are also always thinking in a permanent discontinuation. 
Third, we are uh, in the consultation paper foreseeing the discontinuation of all Uribor tenors, not just one of them. Uh, in fact, the discontinuation of uh, some tenors have already take, took place and with no major issues. Normally, counterparties uh, had agreed to use interpolation in order to, to, to solve the situation. Uh, fourth, uh, the consultation paper acknowledges the recommendations made by the international bodies, ISDA and the May AFT. And finally, uh, you all have to bear in mind that uh, this uh, consultation paper was drafted, was prepared with uh, a precise legislative framework in which uh, the, the current uh, reform which uh, Tillman has uh, just explained to us, was not, uh, was not finalized. So um, we welcome the, the proposal to amend the benchmark regulation in, uh, with the purpose to, to make possible for the Commission to designate a replacement benchmark in certain cases uh, when there is no appropriate fallback it could be uh, a risk of the financial stability but the stillman have said and i think we are we all agree on this should be a solution of last resort it's a safety net as stillman has said there's no guarantee that it will be used and therefore we do we the working group to recommend fallbacks to be agreed between parties rather than relying on legislative solutions so next uh, slide uh, here you have next slide please here you have in this chart uh, very summarized the consultation paper you can see in the first uh, column in different colors um, the views of the consultation paper on the inclusion green or the exclusion red of certain trigger events the orange one has its own explanation that we will enter into at the end of the presentation. Mm -hmm. You have the description of the event. Uh, if uh, it requires a public statement, uh, if the public statement is issued, who is the issuer, either the supervisor or the administrator, and what is the eventuality occurring to the to the to the benchmark to arrive in the last fourth columns. If uh, it is uh, the cessation of, pen, of the of arrival, if this is a matter of non-representativeness, uh, the use of contingency plans by its administrator, or a matter of illegality. So, if we go to the first one, the first one is uh, a public statement made by the supervisor of the administrator of the arrival, stating that the administrator has ceased or will cease to provide the arrival on a permanent basis. So three main points, public statement made by the supervisor and referring to the, to the assessment of the, of the publication of the index. It has to be understood that this uh, trigger event will occur only after any potential mandatory administrator measure have been taking place, as we have been mentioning before. This public statement has uh, to be uh, an official one by FSMA, FSMA, or afterwards by, by ESMA. And therefore, uh, it's not a mere speech or a, a particular or private statement. It has to be of the, in the public domain. And it is a trigger event, which is somehow um, included in the BMR reform, or at least in the, in the drafts that we have, uh, that have been made public. It's in line with uh, with ISDA recommendations and also with the Alternative Reference Rate uh, Committee, the ARC, uh, in the US. The second trigger event is uh, more or less the same, with just one difference. In this case, the public statement, instead of being issued by the supervisor, is issued by the administrator of your right, by any. So uh, here again, like in the first case, it's uh, a trigger event that is contemplated in the first drafts of the, of the reform of the benchmark regulation, and also is aligned with the solutions and the, the ARC recommendations. The third one, which is the so-called precession trigger event, 
is a public statement made by the supervisor and in this public statement the supervisor states that uh, Uribor will state that Uribor is no longer representative uh, or will no longer be representative uh, it is called a precession trigger event because it takes place before the the assessment of the index this trigger event will then take place at the same time uh, of uh, the rubber still being published it is uh, supposed to be uh, activated after any mandatory contribution being uh, being compelled and after any change in the methodology being made as uh, foreseen in the, in the benchmark regulation it is also uh, recommended by the ARC in the US and it is included in this documentation for LIBOR but not for you right here again it's a it's an event which is uh, covered in the drafts that we have uh, seen the public drafts of the benchmark regulation reform now we go to the fourth case the fourth case is uh, the case in which the administrator of uh, Uribor, EMI in this case uh, determines that Uribor should be calculated in accordance with its reduced submissions or other contingency or fallback policies again it's a precessation event because Uribor is still being published and uh, it is uh, it is uh, foreseen for a case in which um, some contingency measure is uh, necessary for the continuity of Uribor and is taken is adopted by the administrator in this case we are not in a case in which the representativeness of the index of the, of the benchmark of Uribor is at risk because if that were the case we would be in trigger event number three here the representativeness is not at risk this is the reason why we are of the view and are asking the stakeholders to opine on uh, the agreement with the proposal of not including this event as a trigger event it is not included by the arc in the u.s recommendations the fifth one is uh, the illegality one it is uh, a trigger event that uh, would be activated when it has become for any reason unlawful under any applicable law or regulation for a relevant party to continue using your right not only because of the applicability of article 35 of the benchmark regulation the one that uh, uh, regulates the suspension or withdrawal of the authorization of an administrator of an index uh, even even it could be also triggered for uh, illegality being being applicable to other parties due to other regulation other applicable laws so here uh, the important thing is to determine uh, who should be these relevant parties that in case of being affected by this illegality trigger event could determine the substitution of the fallback it is clear that in bilateral loans or in derivatives uh, if for either the borrower or the lender in the first one or in uh, for with for one of the of both counterparties in the derivatives world uh, uh, becomes illegal to use a uh, rival in a particular contract in which the rival is being used this uh, seems that uh, should let the, the the contract to have the fallback provision being triggered but in syndicated loans, for instance, uh, the situation could be different. A potential illegality of uh, using Uribor for one uh, of the lenders could be solved just uh, with uh, a prepayment uh, uh, of this uh, lender uh, amount uh, lent instead of uh, forcing on the contract to substitute the, the benchmark by apply, applying the, the trigger event and in uh, the this ones uh, also uh, it's clear that if an investor has a problem a legality problem in terms of uh, being investing in a particular bond or note because of this bond or note being reference to your rival this shouldn't be used as a trigger event of the substitution of uh, the reference rate of your rival in the, in, the, in the bonds or in the notes and all the issues 
by the contrary, it uh, it most likely be a trigger event uh, of the fallback provision if it affects the, the issuer or, or the agent. So uh, the sixth the sixth one is uh, is um, a catch a catch all uh, event, an event of last resort. And it is the one uh, uh, applying in case of the derivable permanently no longer being published. So it is uh, difficult to think in a situation in which uh, this could occur without any of the previous uh, trigger events having taken place. But as a matter of prudency, uh, we consider that uh, this trigger event could be recommended just in case that something has not been foreseen and uh, in case that some scenario has not been captured by, by the rest of the trigger events. And uh, finally, we have the material change of your rival method. And this is an special one because um, if you remember what uh, I have mentioned about Article 20.2, the written plans have to foresee this case. But it is also true that the need to, um, to foresee alternative rates is in Article 28.2 only applicable to the case in which um, the rate uh, disappears, something which uh, is not uh, the case here in just the material change of the method. On top of that, we have to recall that Article 5.3 of PMR requires to the, the administrator to review on an annual basis the methodology of the index, and that this uh, change of the methodology has a clear purpose to prolong its life. Um, taking apart the discussion on what material or not material means, the point here is that uh, the, the material change or the non-material change of a methodology in the opinion of the public consultation should not be understood as an automatic trigger event. Uh, the way to tackle it instead of it, of this uh, uh, automatic uh, application is either by parties acknowledging that URIBOR may material change, materially change and that uh, URIBOR after this change will still be URIBOR because it will still uh, uh, um, measure the, the underlying market, the same uh, reality, and therefore that has to continue being the, the benchmark of the contract. Uh, and second, option for the parties, which is the one, the second one adopted by LMA, is that instead of being an automatic trigger event, it could be an option for parties to discuss whether to substitute or not the existing uh, uh, benchmark, the rival. So we leave it uh, open to the, to the stakeholders to opine on uh, the way in which they would uh, prefer to apply this trigger event. But, uh, have to insist on it. We are not uh, presenting it as an automatic trigger event, but uh, as uh, in any case, uh, either an acknowledgement, an acknowledgement of your rival continue being the applicable rate, which by the other way, perhaps is not even necessary in legal terms, or alternatively to uh, use it as a possibility to enter into discussion among parties on what to, to do. So, um, I think that um, this is uh, a brief summary of the public consultation. In the next slide, you have uh, the exact questions, that, uh, precise questions that are included. I, I would like to finalize encouraging all the stakeholders, all the marketplace to opine, to give us their feedback and to give us their, their opinion on uh, how the working group should uh, recommend to include uh, or not these trigger events. Thank you very much. Now, I think that, uh, yes, William will. Yes, yes. thank start. you. Thank you, Adolfo. Thank you for, uh, oh, wait. Uh, sorry, I had an issue with uh, connecting, so I needed to switch off my camera briefly. Um, thank you, Adolfo. We are now, uh, 
going to the Q&A uh, session. You see on the screen uh, how you can uh, ask uh, questions. And uh, the screen also shows, and that saves me from uh, uh, having to mention it to you. What you can see on the screen is the uh, colleagues, uh, the other experts that are available for us to, uh, to answer questions and to kick things off. I would like to start with a question to uh, to Cam Mayhill of the LMA and to Rick Sandilands of the ISDA, uh, namely, uh, your organizations have also defined trigger events in contract uh, templates for the derivatives and uh, loan markets. How do they align with these proposed Euribor fallback trigger events? Uh, Cam or Rick, who of you would like to start? Uh, hi, William, it's Cam. Can you hear me properly? Excellent. Perfect. Well, thanks so very you, much. Means uh, you're starting. Yeah, I'll start first and then uh, hand over to Rick. So uh, I think it's important just to flag uh, that there are a couple of LMA documents that are mentioned within the consultation paper, uh, and they actually operate very differently and have slightly different triggers. So it's important to be clear which uh, LMA document you're looking at. So the first document that's mentioned in the paper is the replacement of screen rate language, uh, which actually isn't really fallback language at all. Uh, as Adolfo says, it involves triggers for a negotiation process. So as a result, the triggers we have in that clause are wider than uh, fallback triggers because there's no automatic consequence of those triggers. Uh, so the other document to consider from the LMA perspective, which is more in line with what this consultation paper covers, is the rate switch agreement, which we published uh, in September and which has been updated in November, where triggers do lead to an automatic switch from an eyeball to risk-free rates. Um, so I think the rate switch agreement is probably the document that people should have in mind um, when thinking about the trigger events in the consultation paper. Uh, and I would say for the rate switch agreements, we've broadly aligned the triggers with what's in the ISDA uh, fallbacks, which Rick will touch on. Uh, but essentially, we've included the triggers for cessation and pre-cessation events in line with those outlined in uh, one to three that were on the slides uh, that Adolfo was presenting. And the approach we've taken to the trigger events is aligned with that in the consultation paper, which is that trigger events should be uh, objective and clearly defined. Uh, I would say that the one place where we differ from the proposals in the consultation paper is the unlawfulness trigger, which isn't included in our documentation, but that's for precisely the reasons that uh, Adolfo mentioned. Um, I think that you know, in that case, our documents really are broadly designed for the international market. So not just focusing on the Eurozone and given the way that the BMR impacts syndicated loans, but also being conscious of the issues that are outlined in the consultation paper about unlawfulness triggers and interactions with illegality provisions that are contained in loan agreements. Um, so that's one that's not included specifically in our documentation, uh, but it is outlined in the commentary that we've produced for parties to consider, uh, depending on the circumstances, but also to think about provisions that are in the BMR um, on eyeball transition uh, as well. Uh, so I think at that stage, I'll hand over to Rick to talk about the, the ISDA triggers. Thank you, Cam. Uh, William, hopefully you can hear me too. Yes, excellent. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so I think the answer to your question is that the, um, the the fallbacks do broadly align with the fallbacks that ISDA has published. I'll just step back one moment to talk about the documents that we've published because there are a couple of sets that are easily confused and it's important that people have them separated in their mind. So the most recent documents which are relevant to this are the ISDA IBOR fallbacks supplement and protocol. They were published back in October. And there's um, a, a process at the moment to allow people to adhere to our protocol, which will allow them to embed these fallbacks into their legacy transactions. Um, but that protocol itself won't become live, go live until the 25th of January. And so um, we're, we're around a month away from the go live uh, period for that protocol. Um, 
that's also the date on which the supplement will go live and that will have the effect of incorporating these fallbacks into new transactions. And so you'll have an alignment between your new and legacy transactions, provided you adhere to the protocol. Um, the pro adherence to the protocol is, is voluntary, uh, so you do need to take steps in order for that to, to occur. And the triggers which are set out there, um, very much in line with what Cam was saying and what you were saying, in terms of um, ensuring that there's clarity and consistency, the triggers are objective and uh, publicly verifiable. Um, there, there are two cessation triggers, which are uh, a cessation is announced by the administrator um, or a cessation is announced by the supervisor of the administrator. Uh, one of the differences you'll see uh, between the ISDA fallbacks triggers and those that are um, set out in this consultation is that we have a broader array of uh, regulatory and official authorities who can make that announcement and, and still um, uh, effectuate the second trigger. So it could be an insolvency authority for that uh, benchmark administrator. Um, but I think the, the much more likely scenario would be that it would be the, uh, the regulator of the administrator or the benchmark who made that announcement. Um, critically, uh, one, one sort of really key difference is that the, um, the eyeball fallbacks that ISDA has published do not include a non-representativeness trigger. So that third trigger that you can see in uh, the list that Adolfo went through is only included for LIBOR um, uh, benchmarks. So for Euro LIBOR, for example, there is a non-representativeness trigger and it broadly aligns with the non-representativeness trigger set out here. But for Euribor, uh, there is not one. And that's because ISDA held um, a consultation uh, with the public on whether or not to include a non-representativeness trigger and, and there was no consensus on doing that. Um, we subsequently launched a, a second consultation uh, on that question, but just for LIBOR because the information that had been released to the market by CCPs and regulators around their actions um, on, with respect to LIBOR had, had um, uh, been updated and, and there was new information in the market which made that non-representativeness trigger, I think, more uh, logical for the derivatives market. Um, that was not the case for, for your eyeball, for example, or, or the other eyeballs, and so that is not included. Um, I, I, just going down to the, the seventh of those tr um, um, entries on the consultation, talking about material change being made to um, an eyeball, um, that's something which the eyeball fallbacks deal with by acknowledging that that might happen. You, you may remember that your eyeball, for example, changed its methodology um, very recently. Eonia similarly changed its methodology very recently. Benchmarks nowadays evolve at quite a rapid rate and therefore I think the feeling within our working groups was that it was better to acknowledge that that would be the case and for the transaction to continue referencing the benchmark using that new methodology rather than having a fallback triggered at that point which could, you know, if you think about your eyeballs changing methodology it would have been very disruptive uh, at that moment in time to, to have fallen back. And, and ISDA's documentation is um, capable of being tailored. So if, if a change of methodology is in fact very important to you, then it's always possible to bilaterally um, agree to include a fallback on change of methodology as well. Just, just, to, just to finish up, um, the second set of documentation I referred to um, is ISDA's benchmark supplement and protocol, which was published in 2018. That was in response to the European benchmark regulation, but that's a, a generic set of um, fallbacks. They're designed to work alongside um, or underneath the eyeball fallbacks. There's a huge amount of information on our website, www.is.org. So I'd encourage people to go there for further information. Thank you, William. Thank you so much, uh, Cam and uh, Rick. Uh, next question uh, I have is for Michele, and I will combine it with a question uh, from the audience. Uh, the question is, uh, Michele of ESMA, when do you expect action from supervised entities to uh, actually include these fallbacks into contracts? And if I may combine a question of Emilio, sorry, Emilio Gamara, he is asking whether the URIBOR data that the ESMA will publish, uh, whether this will be made available uh, on the uh, ESMA website for free. Michele, the floor is yours.
Oh, I understand now that Michaela has not joined. That means that uh, I cannot ask that question, but I'm pretty sure that this information will be made available uh, for uh, for nothing, uh, as uh, public authorities usually do. Um, so then that means I will go to the next uh, question. Um, do banks, uh, this is a question from uh, uh, Ivo Martinoli, uh, do banks uh, need to activate immediately the fallback rates for contracts with Uribo or, or only after the co consultation is finished? Maybe Adolfo could answer that question, or if he prefers to give the question to someone else. Adolfo. All right, yes, yes. I, uh, I was having problems with the mute and mute. Um, well, I think that uh, the, the recommendation to include fallbacks in the contract is uh, already being issued uh, at different points in time. We have already mentioned also Article 28.2. So I think that uh, it's something that uh, should be done uh, as, as soon as possible. Uh, we are trying to help the market with this uh, set of recommendations that we expect to issue in the future with these trigger events. But at the end of the day, these trigger events are just recommendations are perfectly being manageable by, by counterparties on their own without the need of the public consultation and can be agreed and we recommend them to agree on them as soon as possible uh, even if it were the case uh, not uh, waiting for the outcome of the consultation so uh, i think that uh, it is important if parties have clarity on what they uh, need to cover that they are that they start to, to do uh, thank you very much adolfo uh, Next question I have is for, uh, let me see. Uh, I'm a bit lost at the moment. Um, ah, a question from Michael Schneider. Uh, how do you see the probability uh, of using the fallbacks for Euribor? Because the Euribor panel which currently consists of uh, of 18 banks may become too small to be relevant. This, uh, uh, Adolfo, who would you like to give this question uh, to? Well, um, I think that uh, first of all, we have to recall something that was mentioned in the presentation that um, Uribor has evolved its uh, methodology, its uh, governance, and it's now uh, a benchmark that can be qualified as a Stephen Major has uh, said today, as a robust, resilient and transparent benchmark. So uh, I don't think that uh, banks should be interested in giving up uh, being contributors. In fact, I, I invite uh, all uh, the financial sector uh, to contribute and to join the panel banks uh, in order to, to re-robust what we already have as a robust arrival. So uh, uh, this is the, the first um, thought I would make. And second, uh, if uh, for whatever reason, uh, the number of panelists were reduced, we uh, already have the possibility for the authorities to apply the mandatory contribution. And we also have before this step, which is a tough one perhaps, but we have before the possibility for the administrator to apply the contingency plans as we have um, said uh, and if we recall number four of the trigger events that we were discussing we considered that uh, it was perhaps uh, recommendable not to include this uh, applicability of the contingency plans as a trigger event because um, uh, the application of these contingency plans do not uh, mean that the arrival would be no longer representative. And the importance here, I think that uh, has to be focused on the representativeness of your rival. So uh, I think that uh, we we should wait 
uh, in case that uh, any of these contingency uh, plans take place and if the the representativeness is uh, is assured um i my, i think that uh, the the idea of the consultation paper is not to include uh, such a situation as a trigger event Okay, uh, the next uh, question is an, uh, uh, is an easy one uh, because uh, Eleni Christou Dulidou is asking whether we will make uh, the presentations available uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the website and the answer to that is yes. Uh, then uh, the next question I am going to take uh, and let me check the time because what time do we have? We still have uh, about uh, uh, 10 minutes um the question is what is the main reason that uribor as opposed to other ibor rates is not discontinued uh, this is a question by joris le, le flem who would like to answer this uh, question well i don't know if uh as my is not it's not here i don't know if the if you can hear me Yes, we can hear you. I don't know who is speaking, but... Excuse me, this is uh, Michele Marzoni from ESMA. I have some technical issues. I'm now... Ah, uh, you're back. Apologize. <laughs> we miss the you. <laughs> the, thank you. It's the beauty of a virtual... But maybe we do full, We first do the question I just asked, and then uh, I, we have a few uh, questions for you, uh, Michele. I don't know if you can see me now. Yeah. Very but, well. So uh, I will flip the question and uh, say that uh, a LIBOR is about is has been the process of discounting LIBOR and formally started, as we know. But in many parts of the world, the, the multi-rate approach that envisaged by the working group and European institution in Europe of maintaining an uh, IBOR uh, rate like a LIBOR, while at the same time developing a risk-free rate, new risk-free rate, in our case Esther. Uh, has been uh, taken by many jurisdictions, Australia, Canada, and, and I can continue. LIBOR is the exception in my view, because it's the most important, it's published in five currencies, it's used in five continents, is it's the most tricky situation and, and the one that makes the news because it's the most important, uh, especially the US dollar, LIBOR, as we know. But uh, in, in, if you look at the documents of the Financial Stability Board, where uh, many jurisdictions are covered, the vast majority, Japan among others, uh, took a multi-rate approach where new risk-free rates are developed in parallel to the existing uh, IBOR's rate. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michele. Maybe uh, while while I have you, can you also confirm that uh, ESMA will publish the uh, your IBOR rates uh, uh, on their website and that uh, everybody can use it, uh, uh, let's say, for free? No, uh, I can answer no to this question. The administrator of Euribor, uh, as you know, is a uh, European Money Market Institute, and MMI, has been, uh, as Steven said, uh, uh, authorized by the Belgian FSMA and uh, is the owner uh, of uh, Euribor, ESMA, starting first in one year, 1st January 2022 will be the supervisor of a rival. So we'll ensure that the rival is representativeness, representative of the underlying market and com continuously comply with the MR. But the administrator of the rival will stay the uh, MMI, which is also, as you know, the current administrator of EONIA. Okay, so ignore what I said about uh, this, uh, this topic. And maybe, maybe you can also answer the other question. When do you expect action from uh... Uh, supervised entities to actually include fallbacks into contracts? I mean, when is this starting? Is this how soon? It's a tricky question because from a regulatory standpoint, Article 282 that require in particular European supervised entities to implement uh, what we call fallback provision in contracts uh, has been applicable since 1st January 2018. Uh, we know the implementation has been slow also because with reference to arrival, the work of the working group was ongoing. There were already some general uh, principle and guidance by 
Euribor and by, sorry, by the working group on Euribor fallback. And we know that the number of participants has started implementing those general principles in their contracts. Now that we are approaching the very ultimate uh, uh, recommendation by the working group, that is the precise arrival fullback rate, uh, triggers event and spread adjustment, uh, we will expect uh, next year that uh, European entities uh, follow very closely and quickly these, uh, uh, these recommendations. Uh, so in the course of next year, what I can tell you is that I believe together with national competent authorities, we will take supervisory action uh, to ensure that the recommendation of the working group is followed through in a timely manner. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I can take uh, a question uh, by Christoph, Christopher Nahler. Uh, Tilman, I see that Tilman Luda has already uh, answered it in writing very briefly, but maybe he can elaborate a little bit. And the question is, why does the consultation not address a partial discontinuation scenario where only some but not all tenors of Uribo are discontinued. Would it be helpful to hear, uh, uh, Christopher Nala thinks it uh, would be helpful to hear the working group's views on this topic. Tilman, the floor yes, is yours. Thank, yes, thank you very much. Uh, so the issue is that um, all of these uh, interest rate benchmarks are in reality uh, a bundle of individual benchmarks. If you take the most uh, obvious example, LIBOR, it has five currencies, and within each currency, it has at least four tenors. Um, and they, so that would give you um, basically 20 benchmarks. And it's the same for, for Euribor, it only has one currency, but it has an overnight, a one month, uh, a three month, uh, a six month, and a 12 month tenor. So you already got five distinct benchmarks. And uh, because this is a panel bank benchmark, you could easily imagine a situation where panel banks withdraw from one of the tenors because they don't have data or they don't think it's relevant anymore, but they continue some of the other tenors. Most likely, of course, is that you keep the shorter tenors, uh, so the overnight, the one month and the three months, but maybe you're not so keen anymore, not so keen anymore, the six months. And then each benchmark will have to be uh, dealt with individually, and that's why the consultation never talks about Euribor as, as, as one benchmark, but essentially it is each tenor may or may not be discontinued independently of whether the other tenor, tenors continue, and you'd have to look at that per tenor. And in LIBOR's case, it's even more complicated. You have to look at it per tenor and per currency. Thank you. Uh, let me ask, uh, thank you, Tilman, uh, and I think uh, we can uh, give you also the final question and then we have a short break. Uh, uh, Rafaela Bonadi is, is asking, uh, will the Commission confirm the modification to IFRS as to the uh, heading definition so as to cloak basis, basis, sorry, basis swaps, if so, by when? I'm not, I don't understand the question, but I hope you do, Tilma. I can, I can, I can vaguely kind of guess where this is getting at, uh, but I have to disappoint you because um, uh, I'm responsible for securities markets and IFRS uh, is my colleague. Uh, so uh, if uh, you want to send me the question uh, in the chat, I will forward it to my IFRS colleague. Yeah, maybe it's anyway good that you mentioned this because what we will do with the questions that we are unable to answer is we will uh, uh, we will try to follow up with them uh, in uh, in writing and, uh, uh, and 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 possibly add them uh, to the Q and A document that we have. So I would like to end uh, this uh, panel here, and then uh, we have a, a short uh, fifteen minute break, and then I hope to see everyone back at uh, sixteen. 35 at the latest. Thank you.